Hello, and welcome to Eastern Roman History. The topic of this stream is when did it become inevitable that the Eastern Roman Empire would fall? I'm joined by Mark, channel regular and resident expert on the Empire of Trebizond, and Emmanuel Rizzardi, author of The Last Paleologus and The Usurper. Hello. 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 Good evening, uh, everyone, and good evening, Daniel, and good evening, Emmanuel. Hmm. Well, it's a pleasure to have you both here today, and I think we have a very good topic for tonight, because when did the Eastern Roman Empire fall become inevitable? So I think I will start off with what my position is, and then each of us will go and say what we think, and then we can talk, discuss our ideas in more detail. So I think um, from what I know of Byzantine history that the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire, when it became inevitable that it would happen, is intrinsically linked to its ability to make its own foreign policy. And I think without the assistance of a foreign power. And I think that is lost during the 1340s and maybe early 1350s, when you have this cascade of one disaster after another. You have a protracted, a protracted civil war between John Cantacuzanos and the Regency of John V, which lasts for over six years. And then after that, although the empire has lost some territory to the Serbians, uh, its, its farmlands have been devastated by ye years of warfare. It's, uh, you've had this outpouring of social and political unrest and uh, distrust and then as soon as John the Sixth is finally able to start pulling his resources together and starting to try and um, make reparations uh, the Empire is hit by the Black Death which is also affects the Empire even more so than perhaps other places because a lot of its remaining territories are cities and coastal areas which the Black Death affects the most because they're, it's very easy for it to get to and very easy for it to spread and so the empire is depopulated poor and hasn't got the resources to strike back and then and then uh, Gallipoli is lost to the Ottomans which means that you now have an outside power which is able to eventually spread and take over most of Thrace. And finally, the empire is brought back into civil war in the in 1352 with the attempt by John V to depose John VI. Um, and then much of the 1350s is spent of a civil war between Matthew, the son of John the Sixth, and John the Fifth Paleologus. So I think it's that that 1340s, 1350s period that is when the empire's fall becomes inevitable because it loses most of its resources and its ability to dictate its own foreign policy. Okay, so well, that's my uh, explanation. Uh, sh let's carry on. And Mark, when would you say the fall of the empire became inevitable? Well, it was, you put a hard question to me. Hmm. And I, undenied, truth be told, through a, through a multitude of different, dates and periods and in the end I settled on the 10th of November 1444 which uh, 
um, I'm sure most, most of your viewership knows, is the date of the Battle of Varna, um, the last uh, serious attempt by uh, Europe um, to uh, push out, uh, uh, deal with the Ottoman menace, uh, as it was. And it was a, you know, it was a great crusade. Um, you had uh, most of the great uh, Eastern European kingdoms held in a personal union uh, under uh, Vladislav. And his crusade, unfortunately for the Byzantines, met with defeat um, when Murad II um, uh, dealt with them, um, I suppose. Now, why, of course, do I put this date as opposed to uh, um, many other, including uh, the 1340s, which I do think is an excellent um, pick? It could just be that I am uh, perhaps romantic in that regard. Perhaps I just, I, I, I don't like to admit, I wouldn't want to admit that it was more or less all over for, for a century. But I think the important thing to consider, and even though I am perhaps the most anti-alternate history um, person perhaps there is, but what would have happened had the crusade at Varna met with victory? We perhaps would have seen a stabilization of the situation, uh, at least in the Balkans. And, I think we would have seen the empire survive at least for a time. And, you know, it, it would be the height of arrogance to say that, you know, it would save the empire for, for all eternity. But I, I certainly think that the immediate threat to the empire, the main threat, which was the Ottomans, would have been, uh, you know, would have been diminished. And also you would have therefore have seen a set of Eastern European allies who have a have like a large stake within the empire. You know, they they you know having won this victory, you know they're sort of tied by blood to the empire at that point. And and you you would have seen perhaps a a concerted effort on those on those uh, uh, on on the uh, Eastern uh, European kingdoms part to ensure that uh, Constantinople did not fall. Um, and I think once the crusade met with failure, you can only see the half-hearted uh, response of Europe um, once uh, war with the Ottomans resumed in the 1450s um, to see just how, uh, just, just the consequences of this failure. Well, I um, think and that's why I, uh, just to add I have slightly. chosen Barna. If just to add one thing, it's that after this crusade of Varna, you have almost a pulling out of resources in the area by the West in some respects, um, which they hadn't quite done so before. So when Constantine the Eleventh becomes emperor, there's not all that much he can do except sort of carry on as best he can. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Um, Emmanuel, would you like to give me give us your opinion? Yes, uh, I agree on both topic, of course. Uh, and Constantine the Eleventh was only able to buy a few time, of course. He basically had zero resources to do anything. Uh, he tried his best. He tried to, for example, to rise another army, to uh, strengthen the walls of Constantinople, but was totally in vain for the lack of resources. And uh, of course, about what you have already told us, uh, the point of the early uh, Palaiologan era is the hot point uh, of the points of no return in the history of the Roman Empire. Uh, this is because we have, uh, uh, and this is very strange, uh, a lot of uh, uh, unfit rulers who rule for a long time, especially Andronicus II, and uh, a lot of civil wars in a, a very few time, and uh, of course, a bad political situation who leads uh, to lose uh, terrain and uh, lands uh, on the Ottomans, uh, 
And this is strange because the Ottomans were a, a, a minor tribe in the beginning. In the beginning, and so uh, the Byzantines or the Romans, as we can call them, uh, were not able to defend themselves against a, a minor threat like the Ottomans or the Bay of Miletus, the the Germans, and the, the other bays uh, in the in the west. Uh, west of Asia Minor, of course. Uh, so uh, this is a very sad point to speak about uh, because uh, we have, uh, uh, let's say, not a big power, but a regional power who lost uh, against uh, very small tribes of uh, Gazi riders. Uh, but speaking about me, uh, what I think, uh, uh, of course, as I told, uh, your points are totally correct and accurate. I'm just giving another point uh, in order to, uh, let's say, uh, spread our possibility of conversation about the various topics of Roman Empire. Uh, a topic of no, uh, a topic, a moment of no return uh, could be, of course, uh, uh, the Fourth Crusade. Um, this is because, uh, of course, we know uh, the empire, uh, in a way or another, survived uh, very uh, as a very small state, reduced in size and in power, but uh, uh, it was able to secure a small uh, reign and uh, to strengthen his position and uh, his economy. Um, for example, Nicaea was called the Athens in the east. Uh, so uh, the city was, uh, let's say, uh, not a big one, but uh, a prosperous one, like Trabzon. Uh, so the empire had uh, his possibility to get revenge, but uh, no more as a superpower, but just as a, a local power. Uh, for example, uh, some people can say, as uh, I saw in the comments, that the turning point was Manzikert. Uh, Manzikert, uh, to me, was not uh, a point of no return, because the empire, okay, uh, he was he was weakened, uh, he lost a lot of uh, land, and uh, he lost uh, his uh, strongholds uh, on the border. And uh, after Manzikert, he was no longer able to held uh, the raiders from the central uh, areas of Asia. But uh, uh, the empire still an empire. Uh, for example, uh, the Comnenians were able to deal with the Crusaders uh, in the first three Crusaders and uh, speak with them uh, like uh, uh, if the, Con the Conanians were the emperors and uh, the others just uh, small barbarians. Uh, mm. We know, for example, Alexius Comnenos uh, was um, very, let's say, rude with the Normans because the Normans, of course, uh, tried to conquer Constantinople, uh, to move in the Balkans, etc. But uh, even if the empire was, uh, um, let's say, near to fall, after a few years, uh, Alexius was able um, to maintain uh, an imperial dignity and uh, to not be linked to the Crusaders and uh, to their help. For example, uh, the Crusaders uh, were not needed to uh, make the empire survive. Once uh, uh, the crusaders were able to establish their crusader states, uh, the situation was uh, separated from uh, the life of the empire and the life of the crusaders. The empire was able to hold their, his enemies uh, alone. This situation was no longer able after the fourth crusade. The empire of Nicaea was uh, linked uh, since the very beginning to other and foreign powers. We see, for example, that in the very first stage, uh, the Empire of Nicaea was uh, uh, forced to seek the alliance with the Latins and uh, with the Bulgarians too, because he simply was too weak to fend off uh, the enemies alone. And after that, uh, of course, uh, uh, also after the reconquest of Constantinople, etc., uh, he was linked to Genoa in order to have uh, military uh, supplies and uh, a military fleet uh, to fight uh, the Turkish base uh, and uh, the Venetians. So uh, he was an empire maybe in the name, but no more in dignity, uh, if you can understand what I mean, um, what I am trying to say, of course. And this is why um, the big turning point uh, starts with the, the Fourth Crusade to me. Hmm. I think that's very good uh, point. I mean, uh, I, you do see 
some historians start with not in fact but uh sort of from 1204 onwards as the Nicene Empire and Paleologan Empire was more of a kingdom rather than an empire. Yes. You're quite right in saying that post Some people call them a petty kingdom, like uh, the petty kingdom was in the north. <laughs> yeah, like uh, Bulgaria, although it is an empire, it's not exactly uh, sweeping over vast tracts of land. Um, Correct. And also Manuel manages to extend sort of the reaches of the empire's influence right across Europe in some ways. So, yeah, I think... Hmm. Yes, uh, because, for example, Manuel Comnenos was able to send armies through half of Europe, like to Ancona in Italy, uh, hmm. to southern Italy, to Antioch, uh, and to Egypt. The, yeah, to Egypt, of course, a fleet to Egypt. And uh, if we speak about the Palaiologos, uh, it was no longer possible. They mm. were only able to send some money in order to uh, avoid an invasion from uh, uh, the Kingdom of Naples. But that's all. Uh, they basically had. Uh, uh, I don't. I don't want to say they didn't have an army at all, but basically it was like this. I yes. mean, I I quite like, um, and, and forgive me if I have uh, misinterpreted this, but I do quite like this idea of separating the survival of uh, Byzantium as an empire and the survival of Byzantium as a state. Hmm. Um, I think that's a very interesting. Um, point which uh, both of you have sort of um, um, uh, used in your uh, decision making yes um, <laughs> um, yeah and it's 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 definitely one you can make one make definitely make one thing and I, I certainly like the idea that I did uh, Amanar over um, going for 12 1204 myself um, yeah but yeah. I as I think the, the romantic in me took over <laughs> No, I, I do agree in some ways about Farner because um, there was still, as much as the Op Ottoman state was quite powerful, it was still in a sort of situation where a protracted period of instability could leave it uh, really reeling. Like in uh, after the Battle of Ankara in 1402, it took about uh, some 12 years or so of, after civil war to actually stabilize. And by that point, the empire had been severely halved in power in some respects. Quite a few local powers like the Karaman Turks in Anatolia and even the Eastern Roman Empire to some extent had managed to re reassert some of its power against them. And Actually, the, the year following Varna, I know that Constantine XI, who was despot of the Maria at that point, he did lead a relatively successful campaign into, um, into uh, Greece uh, from the Peloponnese and managed to get the Duke of Athens to make himself a vassal and started to he managed to make his way right up into Thessaly before the Ottomans had to send a, a proper army down to deal with him. I mean, the consequence was that the Peloponnese got a drubbing and basically became a vassal state after that. But I feel like if Varna had been successful, just to go back to um, Mark's previous point, that the Byzantines were still especially in the Peloponnese, because they did have quite a considerable army and some sort of prosperity there. We were in a position to maybe not completely drive out the Ottomans. I think that would be going too far, but at least put themselves in a much better state than they were previously, um, and especially under good leadership as well. I think there's there is a... I think one of the big controversial debates about 
the Paleologan era is sort of institutional weakness versus uh, practical leadership. Uh, and I think it is notable that um, through the empire at that point did have some fundamental weaknesses like corruption. Um, but at the same time, under good leaders like Manuel II or John VI Cantacuzanos, you, you do see periods of recovery. Um, whereas under more lackluster leaders like John V or Andronicus II, you have periods of sustained decline and they can't really inspire their subjects into much... Uh, into the same recovery that their um, successors are able to. So what do you think of that? Mm, personally, I agree. Uh, if I have to add something, is that uh, um, Constantine the Eleventh was able to reach uh, and uh, reconquest most part of Greece. So we can, uh, mm, let's say, see that uh, the Ottoman rule in southern Greece uh, was not as strong as we can consider. Uh, and, uh, of course, Constantine lost just because his army was very small in size. And after the loss in Varna, uh, he simply couldn't stand against the Ottomans. Uh, but mm. uh, uh, with a successful crusade in Varna, and uh, for a successful one, uh, I, uh, I figure... Uh, that it will be possible to recover for the, let's say, Christendom, uh, at least uh, Serbia and Bulgaria. And this uh, could have le le led to uh, another uh, civil war inside the Ottoman Empire. And this, in this case, uh, Constantine XI uh, would have been uh, able to recover most of Greece. And so uh, to have an empire, let's say, like the one uh, in the hands of uh, Andronicus III. So uh, the empire in that moment was in a very critical situation, um, but it was not it was not totally death. Uh, of course, we can also say that because uh, uh, Constantine XI was able to def defeat the last uh, Latin rulers in the south of Greece. So the empire was, uh, let's say, uh, uh, it uh, didn't want to die, I don't know how to say it. Uh, he was very vital, uh, but uh, he simply lacked uh, the opportunities uh, to survive against a uh, strong uh, opponent, uh, opponent like the Ottoman Empire. Uh, for example, uh, Manuel uh, Palaiologos, he was probably the best uh, of his dynasty. Uh, he was a very skilled uh, diplomat and uh, in a very hard situation, he managed to uh, make the empire survive uh, and uh, aligning uh, with the, the correct uh, pretenders in the Ottoman Empire, uh, he was able to recover a lot of territories lost uh, in the previous years. So uh, history is not written and uh, the empire could uh, have uh, recovered a lot of territories if just Varna was... Uh, um, let's say, not a crushing victory, but uh, at least uh, uh, um, a victory for the Crusaders coalition. Uh, I mean, if, I mean, if I, I uh, don't mind me, just there's, there's a comment in, 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 uh, sure. in the chat I would like to um, address, which is that uh, Varna succeeded then, uh, Constantinople would have just fallen uh, again to the Crusaders rather than, um, to the Ottomans, um, and I, I think one, one has to remember that, at least technically, um, the Byzantine Empire was by this point a Catholic state. Uh, it's you know, yes, um, and the even although uh, one doesn't want to, considering what happened in 1204, one doesn't want to uh, go too far with this sort of line of thought. But one does not like to think that Catholics would crusade against Catholics. Um, uh, also and, wasn't you know. the crusade ostensibly to save the empire because or at least the crusade of Nicopolis before it was to 
lift the siege of Constantinople. And this, although the empire, although this um, capital was not actually under siege, there was a determined effort to defeat the Ottomans with that in mind. So I feel sort of Latins constantly wanting to take Constantinople is perhaps something we think about far more than the prin the Christian princes actually were. Yes, I mean, uh, it, was a, it was essentially um, the um, uh, Poles and the uh, Hungarians looked and, and could see what was coming uh, out, mm. of, um, out of the Ottoman uh, territories in the Balkans. So it was essentially a preemptive strike. Um, but and there also quite a lot the, the goal of was there to say Eastern Christians as part. well, like Wallachia involved. Yes. Um, yes. Um, I mean, I mean, the it is rather. Um, you know, I think I think perhaps it, you know one, one's very interested. I'm personally I'm very interested in the uh, this particular crusade and the crusade Nicopolis just by the sheer amount of of, of different. Uh, forces involved um mm. it, it, it it's always i've always found that rather uh, amazing um but yeah i mean it's you know i mean first and foremost they are the, the eastern european kingdoms are thinking about themselves um but there is the goal there certainly to um stop uh the ottomans from being able to turn to deal with constantinople because um, perhaps uh, as history, I think, in the end proved, uh, once Constantinople falls, the Ottomans were able to uh, uh, really make a push uh, throughout the Balkans. Hmm. I want to cast our minds slightly into the previous century and talk a little bit about the period in between uh, John the Sixth and Manuel II, the reign of John the Fifth. Was I have a quote uh, by uh, Donald Nicol, who in his book The Last Centuries of Byzantium from 1261 to 1453 brings up this sh this issue of uh, when did it become inevitable the Byzantine Empire would fall, and um, he says, uh, which I think is a very good and interesting point to make. Uh, to quote, the year 1354 may be taken to mark the point of no return for the Byzantine Empire. As an institution or as the shadow of such, it was to endure for another 99 years. They were the years of the running down process of a great machine which had exhausted its fuel and lost its driving force. At the end of 1354, uh, John V inherited a situation that called for the combined qualities of a Justinian and a Belisarius. His policies were too often dictated by circumstances or contrived on the spur of the moment. But John V could neither see nor uh, grasp the opportunities uh, that was there to unite the Orthodox Christian world against the infidel. The hope of restoring the Byzantine Empire even in its European provinces, was beyond the limits of his horizons. So, and I thought it would be quite interesting for us to discuss uh, both this, what we think of this, and also the reign of John V. Do we think it's just a sort of time of managed decline, or do you think that there were opportunities within his reign that some sort of comeback could have been affected? I go. Uh, well, um, in history, everything is possible, but uh, I tend to think that the no turning point uh, was uh, a bit uh, earlier, like uh, during the reign of uh, Andronicus II. And why? Because uh, after Andronicus II, we had Andronicus III. Andronicus III was a uh, a very good one was uh, one of the best uh, of the Palaeologus emperors, uh, but we see that uh, he was not able to defeat the uh, Ottoman Turks, not because uh, he was bad, uh, because um, bad political decision or stuffs, 
simply because uh, he had uh, not enough money and enough men. So uh, after his reign, uh, it was totally clear that uh, the situation was uh, very, very bad and basically unrecoverable. Uh, so, okay, we can think about uh, skip uh, one, two, or maybe three civil wars during the uh, years after his death. But in any case, the empire at that point was reduced to the most poor part of his former self, like uh, just a part of Greece with Constantinople, uh, with just uh, a very few people compared to one century or two centuries before. And uh, also we had the shadow of Bulgaria and Serbia who were rising to power. And uh, even if the empire were able to fend off those uh, enemies, uh, there would have been uh, Hungary. Uh, and the Hungarians uh, were a lot of more stronger than the, the small uh, Byzantine empire in Greece. So uh, I suppose, uh, well, when I see the reign of Andronikos III, uh, the empire was uh, basically not doomed because uh, we have just say that uh, uh, even um, during Varna, a recover was possible, but uh, um, a recover during uh, uh, even avoiding the civil wars uh, were not possible in that moment uh, because the Ottomans were already too, too strong uh, to, um, to be fanned off. Uh, we, we see, for example, that Andronikos III were not able uh, to save uh, Anatolia and Anatolia was uh, the richest part of the empire. So uh, mm. at that point, uh, the empire was able uh, maybe to uh, survive, uh, to conserve uh, um, a part of its land, uh, especially in Europe, and then uh, to wait for better times, uh, in my opinion. I mean, with with regards to, the, to John V, I think a critical, um, perhaps like a major, Domino, which falls um, in, in, on, on the route to the death of the empire, is um, his civil war with um, Andronicus IV. Um, uh, 1370s. Yes. Um, and 1380s. Because the, uh, the one... Um, because, uh, in, in as a consequence of the um, uh, th of the uh, of this conflict, uh, the Ottomans managed to uh, get their hands on Gallipoli, um, which again, because the Crusade of Gallipoli uh, had actually recovered it for the Byzantines, um, and uh, and as most people. Um, know the geography of the of the region one one doesn't need to uh, uh go too too far i think into the consequences of that but obviously it it, it, it really undermines the it undermines what's the 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 ability of constantinople as a city to uh to fend for itself almost because with a Ottoman presence in gallipoli there is a threat to the seaward uh, trade going uh, into uh, the Mediterranean. Um, not to mention, of course, uh, it, it gives the Ottomans a foothold on the European side, um, which was uh, which proved to be extremely difficult to to uh, to remove them from. Um, mm. But in terms of John the Fifth reign as a whole. It's it's almost I've always thought the very sort of definition of a stagnation. Like, I mean, I know a lot, I know a lot of people say the Byzantine Empire is it's, you know from uh, from the reconquest in twelve sixty one. It was always uh, it was there just stagnating to the end. But I, 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 you look at John the Fifth's long reign, and one almost thinks, well, what did he, you know? What was what was the point of his reign in in, in mm. rather harsh term? I oh, know um, it should just be noted that actually John V's reign is one of the uh, 
periods of Byzantine history we know the least about because all the detailed sources like Ducus and Laracas Calcocondyles are written a hundred years later. So there's probably a lot we don't know, but from what we do, yes, what does John the Fifth do? <laughs> Um, but but what I, I do think we do see, though, we hmm. do see, I think, Nicol, now I do love Nicol's um, The Last uh, Centuries of Byzantium uh, as a work. Um, I wholeheartedly recommend it. I think he's perhaps a bit harsh. He, there, you do see some, you know, not as much perhaps as one could have wanted. We do see John V attempt at times to to do what we see later emperors, uh, what we, you know, what we see them, uh, Manuel the Seconds, the John the Eighths, um, um, and even the Constantine the Elevenths um, um, try to do, and that is, they do see that, he did see that John the Fifth, I think, uh, uh, at least in part, that the only real hope for Byzantium was an intervention from the West. Mm. Um, and you, you see these attempts, which perhaps are blighted by his arrogance, maybe, um, with his whole, you know, it reads almost like a comedy adventure um, when you, when just just what we know about his, uh, his, his trip across um, uh, Europe wanting aid. Um, we don't think quite go to the same ex uh, geographic uh, extents as, as Manuel II. Um, but we, we I, I think you see a recognition of what is needed, but perhaps the uh, execution was uh, uh, less than uh, hoped. <laughs> mm. Yes, I think there's a much more organised and thoughtful approach to the search for West Nave, whereas John V is just sort of running around asking people to help him um, without any real bargaining going on. Um, it, it is, it's, it's funny, in the first 20 years of his reign, he does follow this tack of trying to get Western aid. And then in the last 20 years, from the 1370s to 90s, he goes down the path of appeasement and becomes an Ottoman vassal, which um, uh, Manuel stops because you can see the writing on the wall and those that bias it is just is, yeah, not someone that you can appease. Um, but I think... Especially maybe because of the civil wars, but there is a general sort of lack by John V to look to his solutions closer to home. Because you do have, especially with the breakup of the Serbian Empire, you have lots of little princes in Epirus, Thessaly, uh, Macedonia, and so on that are trying to carve out their piece of Greece and Macedonia. And they sort of just get completely ignored by John V, uh, completely relying on this Western answer, which never comes, except for the Crusade of Gallipoli. And and actually, when the only time that that is sort of appealed to is when Manuel II becomes Emperor of Thessalonica, and then spends about five years as emperor of the city, almost de independent of John V. And although the city, not only is he able to win a victory against the Ottomans, and I think he takes a couple of towns in that area, but he's also, despite being under siege, able to get some of the princes in Greece, like the emperor of Thessaly and the despots of Epirus, to and also the despot of Maria as so sort of pulling them together into a alliance. It doesn't quite work out because he is forced to flee Thessalonica before it's captured. But I feel like if John V had spent more time thinking about practic more close 
closer to home and more practical solutions to what was going on, then maybe he would have had different results. Um, I think this does sort of tie back into the character of John V in some respects, and also the issues of the civil wars that whatever resources the Eastern Roman Empire still had in Thrace and uh, the Aegean Islands was constantly being wasted on civil wars. I mean, it, it's almost staggering how many there were. There was the second Paleologan civil war between John V and John VI. Then you have the civil war when John V uh, fights John VI for the throne and becomes emperor again. And then you have the war between Matthew and John V. And then you've got the civil war between Andronicus IV and John V. And then you have the, the follow-up to that when John V retakes Constantinople and kicks out Andronicus IV. And then there's another short civil war between him and Andronicus IV when the latter is killed in battle. Well, he's not killed in battle, he's mortally wounded and then dies afterwards. And then you have a final civil war in 1390 when John VII takes control of Constantinople and is booted out again. So it's just, you have this 40-year period of constant periodic civil wars that um, really hinder the empire from making any move, despite various opportunities being presented to it uh, in the sort of weird interregnum between the Serbian Empire and the strong Ottoman Empire in the period when the Ottomans are pushing into Europe, but they're still quite not quite in control of everything. And the Serbians have been um, kicked out of most of their Greek and Macedonian possessions. Um, so I think there is some failure on John V's part there. But I also do think that there is some element of, without knowing more, what could he have done differently? Uh, so, yeah, I think it's a very good point by Nickel uh, about that. So, uh, I see we've been going for about 40 minutes or so. So I was just wondering, do we have any more points we want to go over or... Uh, Anything we should uh, bring up, if you will. Something we could talk about is, uh, do you think um, there was a certain inevitability that the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, would always fall at some point? Which is a, a question brought up since the beginning of Byzantine historiography by Gibbon. Do we think that there's uh, the long decline of a thousand years, or is it? Can you can you actually peg it to certain turning points? Well, uh, we have to demand to ourselves uh, what is a decline in order to reply to this uh, question. Uh, if uh, we consider, let's say, the Byzantine period. Uh, comparing to the High Roman uh, Empire uh, period and see the Byzantine, um, la, let's say, uh, based on territory, on the population, uh, or uh, on number of soldiers, of course, uh, this is a period of decline because the empire is uh, weaker, uh, less uh, rich, and uh, with less soldier than uh, the counterparts in the past. Uh, but uh, if we see the decline, uh, let's say in other terms, uh, the Byzantine Empire had some moments of decline and some moments of uh, good uh, prosperity. Of course, we can see that uh, we have uh, very good moments in the very beginning, of course, uh, during the reign of the first emperors, uh, starting, let's say, from Theodosius uh, directly to Justinian. Uh, we have a decline. Um, basically a, a strong period of decline, uh, uh, let's say, until uh, um, 
just uh, the Macedonian period, uh, another decline and uh, a recover during the Comnenian era, and uh, of course uh, a final decline uh, with uh, the Palaiologos. Uh, so, well, just to give you a, a quick reply, to me is not a period of decline uh, at all. Uh, it's uh, not uh, the, the natural uh, history of the empire uh, who is not destroyed during the barbarian invasion uh, in the west and uh, he continued to have a prosperity for a, a bit of time and uh, um, prosperity and decline trust prosperity and decline during uh, his uh, history like uh, all the empires in history of course, uh, we can uh, think about every empire and uh, all the empires uh, got moments of glory and moments of decline. Uh, even nowadays, for example, uh, some people think that uh, the United States empire, if you can call it uh, like this, uh, is in a period of decline, for example. Uh, so it's a very hard question. I mean, I... What... I mean, think if you think the, the, the Byzantine Empire exists for, depending on where you date it from, specifically the start date, which uh, we won't get into, but more or less a thousand years. And you think, well, you know, proper recorded history, like, like the stuff we know, you know, a lot about which we have written record for, is really only at most 3,200 years. So... At least, at least with regards to Europe. So you've got an empire existing, even if even if you separate it from Rome, it's still an empire which exists for about a third of the period of recorded history. Um, and to say it's spent that whole time declining is uh, is is you know it, it's hard to really. How can something last that long to spend its time declining? Mm. I, it's, 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 it's I do view. agree with you. Um, of course, me too. But one has to be careful not to take a too, uh, too. I mean, I, I very much dislike, um, and not, not that I don't think it's a good point, but I do dislike the notion that every empire must fall, so to speak. It's, it's, mm. it, it's I mean, history shows that you know that everything will change certainly but that doesn't the notion that involved does not answer the question as to why it does not help our study of the byzantine empire um but what does help our study is is is, is you know what, what we've discussed here we, we we've looked uh, between us we've looked at a at uh, more or less, you know, three hundred the, the the late Byzantine period, to and we've we've all given our opinions and we, we've looked at how we've got to this situation, and that is we've got to that situation, and that is far more useful than this. Well, you know, Byz Byzantine Empire fell, the the Persian Empire fell. You know, rather than going back through and just listing off the catalogue uh, of of states. Hmm. Ah, I think that both very good points. Um, so I think I think we've uh, managed to exhaust what we're going to say. Uh, so that's about forty-eight minutes running. So shall we uh, come to some final points, or are there any other uh, topics you want to talk about before we start wrapping up? Well, um, yes, I can say something about uh, uh, the Justinian flea. We already spoke about it uh, offline. Uh, this mm. is uh, not uh, a no turning point in order to, let's say, to have a, a surviving empire, but uh, it is uh, an important point uh, uh, because uh, uh, starting from uh, the flea, uh, the empire was no longer able to consider themselves uh, themselves as a superpower and uh, to have the possibility to recover all uh, the empire. Uh, the idea of Justinian and the other emperors uh, before him, of course, uh, 
were to recover uh, all the empire, not just Italy and uh, Africa and a bit of Spain. But uh, uh, the plague destroyed uh, basically uh, the urban civilization as we know it, and uh, most uh, of the army of the empire and uh, most of his economy. So after uh, it, uh, uh, the empire suffered uh, more than a crushing defeat. Uh, it was uh, uh, an event very, very deeper and more important than a lot of war. Uh, done by the empire until that moment. Uh, so it is a point to be considered uh, because mm. the empire uh, before it uh, was able to consider themselves not only the empire of the Romans uh, uh, reaching uh, from Britain to Arabia, but also uh, the only empire who ideally wanted to reach all the lands uh, uh, even through India, like Alexander. Uh, but of course, uh, after the situation changed, uh, this uh, was just a mere dream. Hmm. I think that's a, a good point. And certainly in how the empire changes from master of Mediterranean to uh, fighting for hmm. survival in its corner of... Yes, to a local power. Hmm. Before we... Uh, wrap things up. I was thinking, um, could we ask the same question we've asked here about when it became inevitable that the Eastern Roman Empire would fall? And I think this is a question Mark could elucidate us on. Is uh, Do you think we could say the same thing for the Empire of Trebizond? The uh, Roman Empire Mark II? Um... The problem that I say with Trebizond mm. is that its fate it, it was it was to use your um, uh, your you, the um, your metric which you brought in uh, at the start about being able to exercise its own foreign policy for most of its existence <laughs> the Empire of Trebizond was not able to exercise um, its own foreign policy. Mm. I mean, it, it spent its time being, you know, vassal states of various uh, uh, steppe peoples, um, being under the thrall of uh, Venice or Genoa. Um, I certainly think what, much like perhaps, uh, uh, much like uh, Byzantium, well, what certainly weakens Trebizond was its period of civil war during the mid 14th century. Um, it, and the plague. Well, yeah, of course, it, it, it did get um, um, a good dose by virtue of its uh, by virtue of its um, position. Um, but it, it, it's, it's hard to say it for an empire which you know. It's, <laughs> dare one say it spends most of its time. Um, it spends most of its time sort of slowly, slowly getting, uh, um, slowly fading, um, as, as much, as much uh, in terms of a, in terms of its import, both in the region and to, um, and in many ways to, to Byzantium. Um, hmm. um it's, you know, it, it spends, it, it it's, Far more important, especially to the Genoese, uh, is is Trebizond and to and to uh, other merchant powers. It's far more important by by its trading potential <laughs> than it is by any yeah. uh, any sort of bastion um, of uh, bastion of, of 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 Roman Romanness uh, in in Anatolia. Um, hmm. I think one thing that could potentially be said uh, on that quest on the question is, um, I think things certainly become inevitable that it will be full once it can't play itself off against other foreign powers. That there is sort of a an equilibrium almost that Trebizond can exploit in the area 
And then when it has large powers, like the Mongols show up, it can ally with the Mongols until they've faded away. Whereas the Ottomans are never able to do that uh, in the same way. And as soon as that becomes a reality, then the writing is on the wall for them. Well, I do, I do think in part with that, uh, they did spend um, um, a lot of the time during the rise, uh, so to speak, of the Ottomans, um, uh, lending their forces to those who fought against them, which uh, um, didn't exactly, I suppose, ingratiate themselves um, mm. uh, with the Ottomans when the time came. But I, I do certainly think that, uh, that that's, that's an excellent point of yours. Mm. Um uh, the, the geopolitical maneuvering um, of Trebizond is is, is fascinating, mm. um, and you know they're one say they don't really put a foot wrong considering their predicament for most of their um, uh, history existence. Yeah. But you, you don't see some sort of great um, surge from them. Um, but that, that doesn't necessarily ever mean that they're always going to be destined to fall. I, I don't think you get to a point. I think, you know, perhaps if, if one really wants to put a point on it, the, the, the moment their fall becomes inevitable is when the Ottomans show up outside the city. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, okay, well, I think we've uh, given our answers to this question when did the fall of the eastern roman empire become inevitable and so i think i will wrap things up there uh thank you very much to mark and emmanuel for coming on and discussing this really fascinating topic um i hope you enjoyed it uh i also hope our audience also enjoyed our discussion and uh well if you uh, enjoy Eastern Roman history, do remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel. I want to thank Mark and Emmanuel for coming on today. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. And I think I will leave things there. So it was a pleasure to be with you all again. Hmm. Thank, you for, uh, thank you for having thank, thank you for having me. I very much enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our audience for listening. And this has been Eastern Roman History.